So Becky, should we meet, wait until five minutes after four to start? Maybe just a couple of more minutes. Um, and I'll just tell people we're gonna um, um, spotlight the readers um, and Jacqueline, our MC for the day. Um, I'll, I'll try to be quick about unspotlighting when somebody's turn is over. But when when the spirit moves you, Jacqueline. Okay. <laughs> I'm starting to feel the movement. All right. And people just know you can you can move it back to gallery view at any point up in the view corner of upper right corner of your screen. But um okay. Right. Hi everybody and welcome. I'm Jacqueline Sheehan. I'm the president of Straw Dog Writers Guild. And I am so pleased to welcome you all to the 2023 reading of our 2023 residents from the Edith Wharton and Straw Dog Writers Guild Writers in Residence program. Um, I am hoping that Patricia Pinn comes along. And I know that all of you know Pinn. Um, who were residents at Edith Wharton. Um, so we have today um, two recorded readings from uh, writers who can't be with us today, and those will be first, and the rest of the uh, readings will follow that. After the readings, um, we'll have a chance for the, for the writers to talk a little bit uh, briefly about how the experience at the Edith Wharton Mount imp impacted their writing and impacted their lives. Doesn't have to be long, but we're sure curious and we'd like to know. Um, I have to say that uh, from the Straw Dog perspective of things, this is a program that we are so proud of and it's so meaningful to us to be able to give a little leg up to writers at a point when most writers really need it um, because writers need a lot of help and we need to help each other. And that's really been the calling card of Straw Dog Writers Guild here in Western Massachusetts. Um, and I would like to give a little shout out to Becky Jones. I know all of you know Becky, but um, she is the one who does all of the hard, hard work of sorting the applications when they come in. She did that uh, last year and um, just kind of keeping everything really organized. And I know how much this program uh, means to Becky. So I think we should go ahead and get started. Um, if Patricia Pinn um, appears, I'd love to introduce her. So Becky is going to uh, help us see the first reading from Cat. Cat Wheel. You ready, Becky? Yeah, I am. Um, I'm just and so Cat Way, and then um, I will share her. Mm. So can you all see that? Mm hmm. Okay, and. Um,
Can you hear her? No. All right, that's a problem. We will. Okay, well, I'm going to unshare here. You want to move on to Catherine, or should we move on to? No, let me just let me just try um, her again because if um, if I can't get it, then I, we're in trouble anyway. So. so edited yes. my time at the mount and the no. other. I still can't also hear. Also edited. In you can. Hear. Can you make it louder? Right. About a year ago, but sometimes you know you need time in between uh, generating before revising. So, you can't the first make it poem I will read um, is called "As Close as I Have Ever Been." At the train station in Xinjiang, I see my father's eyes in my aunt's faces, and how they rush me, all three just as short as I. Then all around is a clutching of skin, bridging 10 years since I've seen my kin. As my uncle opens the door of his caramel car, it fills with our bodies and the press of urgent questions held too long, like, how is brother really? And your mother's health. I become an ambassador to my parents. I do my best to assuage. My uncle pops a cigarette between his lips and his wife swats it away. We laugh and our kin feels how it means, related, growing up. I never saw my face in the faces of others. I stopped looking in the mirror because all I saw was grief, its lonely yellow hunger. Now I'm nestled in the back between my two aunts with matching perms sweet schoolgirl style of the dear Teresa Tang who sang the moon represents my heart and isn't the moon the thing they say I love you to and back from isn't that saying about the moon really about returning I feel so close to them now as close as I have ever been they hardly know me and still they claim me make me feel what I'd missed This second and last poem I'll read, uh, I originally wrote just about a year ago, um, and it's about summer, and it's called End of Summer Tomato, ripe, soft and giving, bright bulb dialed dark as a bruise. When I raise a knife to its flesh, the silver glint it gives without resistance lets me like butter that's waited for hours in a room. At first taste, soft and enfolding, its brush feels like love, sweet with only a rivulet of acid. It wants to give. Let me talk about surrender, how it looks like singing sun steeped all summer, awaiting the right time. Had I ever had a tomato before? No. Love strikes me like a warm memory with its surprise. Comes for me like the mouth of autumn, understanding what was not ready before. Let us tend to each other now. Let us tend. Green tongues textured with time, flushed past redemption, take me near rotten, a tender breath on my tongue. Thank you so much again. Sure. Oh, okay, uh, we've got the sound for Cat Way. <laughs> Hold on just one moment. I will get her picture up. This, um, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, this is Catherine Easter, so I need to stop sharing again. My mistake. We just heard Kat, and I have two recordings of her because um, later we will be hearing both from Kat and from Catherine about their experiences at the Mount.
the technical glitch here. This is Catherine Easter. I'm just going to read a few pages of a story that's excerpted from my untitled novel in progress. The novel is set in LA in the late 90s, and it tells the story of a first generation Chinese American girl who attempts to unravel the mystery of why her mother left Taiwan for the US and what she's running away from. When I was 10, I found a black and white photograph in the back corner of my mother's closet. Hidden inside a shoebox and jutting out of a stack of old letters, it captured what appeared to be the edge of a pond. It was an arresting shot. The water looked silvery with a faint mist hanging over it. At the same time, the overhead camera angle conveyed a sense of danger and foreboding, as if whoever had taken the picture had been waiting for something to emerge from the water something unnatural. Or at least that's what I imagined while I stared at it, until finally a strange tingling in my hands caused me to drop the photo back in the box and flee the room. The room was technically my parents' bedroom, though during those years my father lived and worked in Taipei. Like a seasonal marker, he would visit my mother and me in Los Angeles exactly four times a year. My parents were naturalized citizens who had immigrated to the US when I was two. In the beginning, they had done a series of odd jobs, barely getting by. Their primary goal had been to save enough money for a down payment on a house. We couldn't wait to move out of our cramped apartment. But after several years of job insecurity, my father returned to Taiwan to his former job in hotel management. My mother and I stayed in California and when I entered first grade, she took a part-time job at a local bank. My mother was kind, sometimes too kind, but emotionally distant. She often lapsed into long silences and stared off into space as if she were far, far away, no longer in the room with me, no longer in the present. Since she was averse to talking about the past, I learned not to, not to ask questions. Consequently, I knew very little about our ancestors. What I intuited was that they were somehow responsible for my mother's fear of water. Because of her phobia, I was not allowed to take baths, only showers, and swimming lessons were out of the question. Without a family history, I felt not only untethered, but painfully self-conscious in America. If my mother was haunted, then I was the opposite of haunted since haunted people possess memories which connect them to life. I was more like a ghost looking for someone or something to haunt, without which I might float away. Once in a supermarket, an Elvis song came on the sound system. That's someone you never forget. As I hummed along to it, my mother began to cough uncontrollably. Her coughing grew so severe that we had to leave the store. The moment we stepped outside, her coughing stopped, but she refused to go back inside for our groceries, so we left them sitting in the cart in the bread aisle. Looking back is like death, my mother said. It's better to keep moving forward. And I'll stop there. Great and wonderful job, Becky, with the technology to to bring us those two writers. Um, next, I am so happy to introduce Parvati, who I have to say just briefly, steal a little moment here that uh, I wrote with Poverty in Guatemala. We were together at a writing retreat there. Please welcome Parvati. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here. And Becky, thank you for the innumerable emails you've sent to um, to organize all of this. It's it's not easy and I, I really appreciate um, all that you've done for, for the writers. Um, I'm um, reading from a piece that um, I actually wrote in my time at the Mount. Um, and um, uh, I as you instructed us, Becky, and um, it, I, I'm in the process of writing uh, memoir, uh, which will have several chapters. The memoir is related to 
cooking and food and my memories of growing up in India and then um, what food, that kind of food has come to me um, in America. So um, the piece I'm reading from is titled Chai, which uh, means uh, tea in Hindi. So in school, I had a close friend, Kusum, whose home I visited often. Kusum's mother had died when she was an infant and she was raised by her father and his mother. Her grandmother was an imposing woman, impeccably dressed in iron silk saris each time I met her, her hair in a high, neat bun. She always greeted me affectionately before yelling at her help, chai lao, which loosely means serve the tea. While the tea was being prepared, Kusum and I would disappear into her room and we would be summoned to the living room sometime later. Chai would be waiting in a large porcelain teapot. Kusum's grandmother watched closely as they helped, as they helped pour the tea in a ribbon that descended from the spout and gurgled into the cups. If drips did not stain the crisp white tablecloth, she would smile faintly. But if a drop or two escaped the cups, a deep crease would extend from her hairline to her eyebrows, her displeasure taking the better part of the afternoon to wear away. The chai served in Kusum's home was aromatic and fragrant with spices. And I learned later that it was called masala chai, chai brewed, brewed with spices. The scent of cardamom and cloves hit the nose first and the undercurrents of fresh ginger, turmeric and ground black pepper revealed themselves on the second or the third sip. The tea was usually boiling hot when it was first poured into the cups. And if one waited for it to cool, a thin skin of milk cream formed across the top. I was too intimidated by the old lady's silk saris and her frown to do anything but drink the skin down, gulping discreetly till I could swallow without gagging. Kusum, on the other hand, would deftly scoop up the skin with a quick finger and deposit it on the saucer, while her grandmother used a small spoon that she would drop with a clatter onto the tray, all the while scolding the health for not straining the tea well enough. The tea was rich and comforting, particularly on the days I felt a cold coming on or was tired from being a 14 year old. But as I visited Kusum's home more often to share in this afternoon tea ritual, I became increasingly aware of the financial differences between Kusum's family and, Amma, and mine. And I started to feel a knot in my stomach as I drank the tea. My mother always made tea for herself and any others who happened to be home. Resting on a sofa while tea was made for her by hands other than her own and then poured into a cup for her was not a lux luxury she had ever experienced. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Parvati. So much meaning can be had in food and an entire world can be had in food. Thank you. Regine, you are next. And uh, Regine Jackson was part of an Emerging Writer Fellowship and joined in with the writers at the Mount. And I am a huge fan of her writing. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, today, I'm actually going to be reading a piece I workshopped while, uh, while at the Mount. And this also influenced the first draft manuscript of the novel I've just completed. I'm just a bit hesitant about reading the rough draft right now. So I will read to you the spoken word piece I, that has inspired it. It's called The Wrong Miss M. You told me, chest puffed out like a cockatoo, that you read Maya Angelou to your daughter every night. I didn't realize it at the time, glazed and confused by your framed certificates, degrees, and faux pedigree, that you were pruning her to be a woman the complete opposite of me. Sure, I'd been seized, picked, and feathered by an environment that tethered me to a primal pain and shame that wasn't my own. I now know, I now know why that cage bird sings. If a canary's croon became a screech, it wouldn't be able to stop. This world is that twisting mine, and through my mind's eye, I'm afraid I'd be blinded by the glaring sights I see. They say diamonds are a girl's best friend, 
but I am a woman with rent and bills to pay. So much to my chagrin, cubic zirconia will just have to do. I may speak in flowery purple prose with a cadence like skipping stones in the ponds at Forest Park, where the ducks are nestled so close together. Mm. But don't be mistaken, I don't have everything in a row. A writing workshop. In this city, not everyone can be your friend, but some state reps would just love to be your buddy. These are not the Kennedys, but if you can't reach for the cosmos, go for the trees. Leaves and money burn the same and smell just as rancid. I've known wealthy men who are only single on the weekend. They spout words as real as the cheap honey cut with sweet nothings at your local North End bodega. They say a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down, but what if that bitter pill was never meant to be swallowed by soft and malleable women like me? Misguided, misunderstood, misaligned with my roots, there are no sister locks here. They dread around me, but not with me. When the only rooms that fail to hear me speak have the bluest of eyes, what am I supposed to do? I am not some minstrel show. I don't mean to speak like Shelley, Lovecraft, and Poe, where the horrors of the unknown are nothing compared to the horrors of just walking down the street. All that glitters is in gold, but I much prefer silver. It's the color of stardust. Spectral seraphs sprinkle the night. There aren't skies much darker than these anymore. The corpses of shooting stars are the only alloy casings I'd like to have in front of me, because at least then, I could look up without crying. Thank you. My goodness, thank you, Regine. Thank you. I love that you mentioned Forest Park, which for those of you who don't know, is this quite beautiful park um, that borders uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, and borders all of the harder things around it as well, which really beautiful, Regine, thank you. And I, I do want to say that um, for those of you who aren't reading today and are not maybe uh, writers, that we had asked our writers to pick a three to four minute selection. And that is so hard to do. It is so terribly hard to do, especially for fiction writers. Uh, please welcome Martha. Um. Thank you, Jacqueline, and thank you, Becky, for organizing. Um, I'm going to read a possible opening for the novel in progress that I worked on um, while at the Mount. So this takes place um, primarily in Vietnam during the 60s, um, during the war in Vietnam. Smoke drifted through the house, carrying with it the scent of charred wood and burnt paper. In the living room, Swan knelt beside an unassuming cardboard box, feeding its contents into the fire. Letters folded into themselves, disintegrating into small heaps of ash. Nunn's instructions were to destroy every last page, all of his most important work in the National Police. Transcripts of interrogations, evidence of his colleagues skimming money from the treasury, maps tracing suspected communist travel routes in the Central Highlands. Swan was about halfway through when she noticed it. Peeking out from the bottom of the pile was a thick, plain manila envelope with a wax seal. Even now, years later, she insists she hadn't known she would open the envelope until her fingers had already slipped under the flap. From outside came the distant staccato sound of gunfire and blaring speakers. The coup they had been warned was coming. The phrase sounded, the phrase sounded strange and abstract to her a word she associated with impassioned politicians in foreign headlines, not chief or any of the men who worked with her husband, men whose wives and families she hosted for dinner and tea. But it was chief's voice over the sound system instructing his men to keep fighting, chief calling for the end of a regime. None should have called by then with instructions on where to go, but the line hadn't rung since that morning. In the afternoon when she picked up the phone, it hissed a sound that told her that the signals were jammed. Now she held up the envelope, considered its weight in one hand. Without thinking, she tore open the wax seal. Swan peered inside at the pages, pressed perfectly one on top of the other. 
There was still time then, in those last few seconds, to reconsider. To burn it all like her husband instructed and go on to do one last check of the house. But in the last two weeks, there was something insufferable about Nguyen's display of discretion. Shutting folders when she came into his study, keeping his agenda inside his work bag instead of his desk like he used to. Really, what could possibly be worth all of the fuss if in the end he left all this to her? Sun sometimes suspected that men like her handsome husband, with their crisp uniforms and neatly combed hair, liked to hide behind caution to conceal the dullness of their work. Just one peek now, she thought, would confirm it. She pulled the papers from the envelope, for a moment struggling with the tightness of the enclosure. The stack landed on the floor with a light thud. Then she saw it. On top of the first page in small block letters read a name, a name she had not heard or seen in a long time. She felt the color drain from her face as smoke from the fireplace continued to climb the walls. Sparks from the fire fluttered up and out like tiny stars gone dark. Someone pushed her face closer to the ink. Was her mind playing tricks on her? Was she seeing things? But the letters remained fixed. Din's name. It seemed impossible that when she finally accepted the reality of her life, when she finally buried all those old ghosts, that one of them should appear before her now. But Din was no ghost. Din was alive and on the National Police's most wanted list. Nun's most wanted list. A communist responsible for the death of dozens of his men. At first, she was too stunned to calculate. Din was alive, as in not dead. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Martha. Oh, I am totally in. You could have just kept reading and reading and I would have been right there. Thank you. Uh, Emily, you are next. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. And thank you, Becky and everyone for organizing this event. Um, I'm going to read also from a novel that I'm working on that I worked on while at the Mount. Um, it is about the 16th century playwright Kit Marlowe, and he has just died, and the narrator has gone back to Kit's house and is remembering at this point. That first night in Kit's house, a year before he died, I laid the witch marks, an old thing more ritual than magic. I knew how from my mother, always the doors and windows first, and then the corners. Above the doors and windows, an ash mark with salt and water, rosemary from the garden, dried lavender Kit's mother had sent him. Perhaps Kit had always been interested in growing things, and I just hadn't noticed. There was a kind of steadiness he wanted to, that he longed for, that he didn't know where to find, except in the earth that housed the dead. In the corners, a carved daisy wheel, soft, small in the soft wood, for each, a burn mark at the rafters above, singed by holding a candle to it till the wood darkened, a mark of ash. Kit watched while I did it, his face keen. He was quiet and still, unusually so. I moved to mark the edges of the fireplace. Why there, he asked as I held the candle to the mantel. So nothing can come through the chimney, I said. He nodded, eyes fixed on the little mark. Spirits, you mean, he said. I nodded, and witches, demons, ghosts. He made his mouth small, teeth denting his lower lip white. I'm more worried about people, he said instead, finally. But thank you, Will. We slept in the new bed, and when I woke in the morning, he was not there. Necromancy, in some ways, was not so far off from those marks from ashes of herbs smeared over a door frame. An old thing and simple, my mother's cousins might have told me as much. They had buried him near where he died, in Deptford. His death was not doubtful, but still they had put him at the northern edge, as though they could tell, from looking, from a coroner's false summary, from his name, his wounds, that he was not one to lie quietly. But the churchyard was silent, eerie. Kit was three days dead. The moon was high and clear in the way that he had loved. He would prop himself on his elbows at the window, staring up at it, bone white, gleaming like the curve of an uncovered skull. It makes one believe in celestial music, he'd say. The morning after the witch marks, I had found him on a little flat spit of roof tacked on just below one of the windows. He climbed out on it, wrapped in a sheet. He had a cup in his hand, the dregs of wine, and his book face down over one knee. He was staring off into the watery fugue of the nascent sunrise, it was clear he hadn't slept. I cantilevered myself down beside him, legs folded, ungainly as an adolescent gosling. He reached out with his own pale foot and ran it along my cap affectionately against the grain of the hair. It felt like goosebumps, the touch of a living ghost. 
do they work? He asked the marks. I almost said unkindly that he did not believe in ghosts. So why did he care? Anne and my brother both had made me wary of traps of bearing even an inch of soft belly. They were always seeking points of weakness to hit. And therefore so was I, but Kit wasn't like that as I well knew by then. And his face still held that peculiar intensity. He pretended to wear everything so lightly that sometimes it was easy to forget how clever he really was. But sometimes it was like being flayed to be seen so clearly. Only if I told him he was wrong, he believed me the way that honest people believe you, even against their own instincts. He was like that, though he was also a liar. I think so, I said. Kit hummed. But they don't work against bad dreams, I suppose. I didn't ask. I gave him my hand, and he put the wine down and held it, his hand thin and cold in mine. I thought he saw his sister's ghost in dreams, or dead Tom Watson, or the man Tom Watson killed. I didn't ask. I should have. That was a year ago, a little less, his hand in mine, his foot against my calf, cold, but alive, 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 his laughter on the stairs. When I finished this, I vowed, bending to my graveyard work, I'd score the marks out by the window. I wouldn't keep him out. He was always cold at night. Emily, thank you. And, you know, as you were reading, I was picturing how being at the Mount and in that wonderful B&B &B would just be the perfect setting for you to really work on this kind of story that you could really sink into it there. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Kiona, you are next. Hello. Hi, okay, so the piece that I'm gonna read is from one of the chapters of my debut memoir that I'm working on, Mainline Mama. And it's basically giving a little bit of context of where I come from and how um, prisons affect communities. Before we were boxed in, before they started taking folks I've known my whole life and putting them in new boxes, prisons or caskets, our box was supposed to be home. You know, like Stephanie Mills' song in The Wiz, when I think of home, I think of a place where there's love overflowing. Our box was a place of uplift and security, but it ended up a place where there's only one way in and one way out for all of us. Where I'm from, one of the first questions people ask is, where are you from? You claim a place and a place has to claim you ba back. That house, I didn't live there until I was 19, but I always did. My mail never went there, but I always did. After school, winter break, spring break, summer, that's where I felt comfortable and safe. It will always belong to me, regardless of what the deed says. I was raised in a box. I mean, not literally, but seriously. My mom and I always lived in apartments, little boxes stacked together in units and complexes on different street grids in Los Angeles, California. But these apartments were never home. Our apartments were always a place to sleep. They never belonged to us, and I never felt like I belonged there. My mom loved everything clean, so our house was like a museum of cleanliness. It was pretty, orderly, well-maintained for anyone who would come visit. But when you live in that house, there's no comfort. My mom worked all the time, so we were never there. Our couch had to last, so we couldn't sit on it. We never ate meals at the table. My mom wanted to make sure the space would last and she was always worried about something breaking or having to replace something. You wanna watch TV, sit on the floor, but don't mess up the clear vacuum lines that she made sure stayed in the carpet. You're hungry, stand in the kitchen and eat. Be sure to clean up after yourself. Our mail went to our apartment. It was listed as our address for everything, but it was never home. Home will always be my granny's house on Courtney Street, built as a wall, built as a part of a walled community called Franklin Squares in Watts, California. Granny's house was boxed in by cr concrete and asphalt in an off-white brick wall welcoming you to Courtney Street, a road leading to two cul-de-sacs, one way in, one way out. When she first moved into the house in 1979, it was yellow, but I never knew that until I looked at old photos. Granny's house is a lucky house. She won it in a housing lottery by the WLCAC for low-income folks in 1979 at Will Rogers Park, which is now named Ted Watkins. Granny told me she thought it was fake, but went to the park anyways. The lottery was April 1st, April Fool's Day, 
but the chance at a real house was too big to pass on. You had to be in the park the day of the lottery. So 1,600 people gathered in the park with Ted Watkins, Mayor Tom Bradley, and Governor Jerry Brown to win 39 houses. Granny always told me she was the second to last name drawn. And I'll stop there. Oh, I so wish you didn't have to stop there. Um, you know, the, those descriptions of boxes and houses and the description of no comfort here. Very striking, very strong. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you for Becky for organizing everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Emily, you are next. Hello, thank you everyone. Um, so I worked on two projects at the Mount. One, I was revising a historical novel that was set uh, largely in New England in the winter. It was kind of like perfect for all those beautiful things in the landscape. And then I was working on a new novel that's set in 2022 in Los Angeles, um, which for whatever reason is the one I kept being drawn to. Um, so I'm going to read a little passage from that one. Um, did write this passage at the Mount. Um, and I think the only thing you need to know uh, is that it is a, a brother and sister uh, it's from the sister's point of view and they are riding a motorcycle um, from Los Angeles out to a house uh, that they lived in as young children um, following the death of their father. The traffic calmed as we left the city, falling into the slow thrum of long distance commutes. Drivers don't honk in Los Angeles, not the way, the way they do in New York or Boston, an effect I believe of sunshine and legal weed Rage appears in dazzling firework bursts, but it doesn't propel us very far. It fizzles before we've traveled two exits. When it is 70 degrees Fahrenheit for the 90th straight day and you're two hours out from one half of a 10 milligram gummy, you cannot stay mad the entire distance from Los Feliz to Culver City. This is a biological fact. Still, humans weren't made to sit in traffic and wildness asserts itself in other ways. Always there's a shiny black car that looks like it was made by NASA, threading through the 101-110 interchange with such surgical grace that watching it, you feel something akin to what you feel looking at a waterfall, the awfulness of inhuman force. Released from highway stall onto an empty ramp in East Hollywood, men on tiny Japanese motorcycles pop wheelies or spin donuts. Teenagers in Buicks that haven't passed an emissions test in 20 years blast bass so loud that the mismatched doors shake and a quarter mile of the 170 becomes a temporary and non-consensual commons as everyone dances in their cars or sighs and gives up on trying to hear the latest author interview on NPR. But now we were out past Pomona and people were no longer human. An eerie calm pervaded, a steady rhythm of acceleration and deceleration, an endless procession of perfect zipper merges. Driving east out of Los Angeles is like swimming in a fast river. You submerge yourself into the 210 towards Pasadena and remain, remain under for 100 miles. You move, but the medium never changes. It's water, 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 then you come up somewhere different. I'd never gone back to the place we lived as children. It hadn't occurred to me that I could. I was young enough when we left that the old house was swaddled in fairy tale fog, an imaginary place conjured out of a child's need for privacy and refuge lands through wardrobes and secret gardens. Instead, I had dusty acres of coyote tracks and bleached bones and abandoned Airstream trailers, empty except for nests of dirty blankets and mouse droppings and discarded bottles of Jack. Feral, unsupervised years. They'd sunk into some part of myself I could no longer dig down to. But neither had I shaken them out of me. I'd come back to California, even back to the desert in short forays, triangulating towards the first place, the familiar landscape, creosote and sagebrush and dusty yellow hills. Hiking in Joshua Tree or camping miserably at Coachella, pictures at Pappy and Harriet's, shouting over some almost famous folk band to tell whoever I was with, I grew up here, feeling that was almost true because the desert is a bit like the highway. It doesn't divide, it keeps itself whole and you dissolve yourself into it. You spread thin, you look up at the sky and get dizzy. And I'll stop there, thank you. Oh, thank you, Emily. Um, that smell of creosote um, is such a powerful reminder of the desert. And the desert definitely made a big thumbprint on this character. Thank you. 
Mario, you are next. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to read, I guess, from the opening of this novel I'm working on, because the rest of it's in shambles right now. Um, it's about the convent of religious sisters in rural Jersey. And eventually, I guess, during crisis over if one of them has had a vision. But this is just the first couple pages for you. <laughs> the arrival of the new personal computer at Immaculata Convent was overshadowed by the decision of the convent's youngest sister, Sister Claire, to leave the order. A week earlier, she had told Mother Gabrielle she no longer believed the clergy was her calling, that she'd misinterpreted the signs, that her faith was wavering inside this place. After several days of deliberation, Sister Claire, now once again Heather, was handed a one-way bus ticket purchased on the convent account and returned home to her parents in Slingerland, New York. The older sisters had always had their doubts about Heather from the moment she'd arrived. She'd come to them as a novichette from Sacred Heart after the diocese had closed their parish. In a note to Mother Gabrielle, her previous superior had said of Heather, some of the others find her difficult to live with, but this I find is something that usually gets ironed out with time. But it never seemed to get ironed out, no matter how much time had passed. She fidgeted all throughout prayer and had a hard time adapting to the sisters' daily routine. Unlike Sister Catherine, their other youngest addition, who had easily fallen into the sisters' day-to-day -day rituals of prayer, service, and chores. Sister Catherine had been the only one who thought that Heather would make it to her final vows. Now, as Heather was probably at some bus stop in upstate New York looking for her parents' car, Sister Catherine felt like quite an idiot. There was lots of hushed hurrying in the convent. As Father Mark unpacked the computer in the den and played with the bundles of cable, the priests had already owned a computer with internet access for two years. The sisters had heard so much about spreadsheet programs and email, and soon they would be able to surf the net. But the World Wide Web would have to wait. The entire convent needed to be rearranged to cover up the hole left by Heather. Sister Catherine, who was now the convent's youngest sister, had been charged with packing the ex-sister's blue and white habits away. She sealed the box with packaging tape and shoved it into the furthest corner of the basement. If any new sister were to join them, it would not be for some time. Mother Gabrielle vacuumed and dusted with great difficulty, what with all the arthritis that riddled her hands and knees, and Sister Gemma had to take over for her. Sister Agatha, who always had the excuse of her kinked neck, rarely participated in any physical activities and had put herself in charge of going through the things Heather had left behind. Sister Catherine and Sister Magdalena were in charge of boxing up those things that Sister Agatha had deemed worthy of holding on to. Sister Magdalena was middle-aged, but among the sisters, she was considered a sprightly young thing. She had taken Sister Catherine and Heather under her wing when the two had arrived. She had shown them how to navigate life in the convent. Never plug anything into the outlets next to the kitchen sink or you could catch a nasty shock. Always lie to Sister Agatha about how good her roast chicken tastes. Do not trust Sister Gemma with any secrets. You might as well shout them from a mountaintop. She taught them how to get the downstairs toilet to flush and how to light the water heater. Mother Gabrielle called the two young sisters Sister Magdalena's goslings. This isn't the first time someone has left here, Sister Magdalena told Sister Catherine. Their arms were filled with boxes. Sister Catherine could not respond. She was too busy trying not to drop everything down the stairs. Sister Maria left during my seventh year here. She was old as I am now, and she was the last I'd expect to leave. She left to take care of her parents in Indiana and never came back. It's hard to say what direction others have been called in, Sister Catherine said. I'll stop there. Mm. Thank you, Mario. I know people will have a lot of questions about this um, if they get a chance to ask anything. Um, I love that list of um, advice that was given about the outlet so you wouldn't shock and uh, say that the chicken tastes good and how to flush the toilet. Um, fine advice, I think, all those things. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Lindsay, you are our last reader. Hi, everybody. It's really good to be here. And um, thank you, Jacqueline, and thank you, Becky, for everything you do for Straw Dogs. And it's great. It's so great to hear everyone's voices and also to see Kiona and Regine and Catherine, who I was with. I'm going to share um, two or three poems. I'm not sure. Um, 
from what I worked on. It's my second collection. The working title is Brink. And it's really about um, kind of examining that tension where something is coming into being. <clears throat> it's not quite there, but it is on its way. Human. A frightening ache fills the air above the pond. The pond is round, simple, perfect its circumference. Wind is not round or simple, does not land upon the pond. Wind brushes, caresses, and her caress carries bitter, bitter heron loon up, left, right, through the air, through the ache and fright rising from the primal of the human howl. The three birds tremble, flinch, winged within the dark that hovers above the pond. There is no refuge, there is cost. Earth flames and sputters, a human howls. The pond's wetness lips the earth, cattails, lilies. The pond's wetness, the not round wind and the dark know everything. The drowning. After the pulling, her blank breath, we red-eyed, no grip, no hand to hold. After the pulling, a pall shrouded the beach. Wind barely sifted the summer heat. Shock swallowing, pulling, as if a gigantic star dying, as if dying carved of an unknown element we cannot name or hold its scent. Its scent, shadow and remembrance. Remember how she lay there after the pulling and you after they took her away? You outline the weight of her laying too long, unmoving. Your finger trembling, tracing. You almost lay down too, almost crawled inside her imprint. I watched you, you so lost, we so silent, soaked in our stunning. We and she and all our edges disappearing when the tide came. The last piece. A woman and the bardo. Nothing and no one moves. Her car is totaled. She makes out a blur of bodies, a doe and her fawn, maybe a man and a small child forming a constellation splayed on the road. Beyond the shattered windshield, she senses a vast field, a river quietly swimming itself through earth. The only script she locates in her mind lingers between two worlds. She wonders about Lazarus, the bardo. Perhaps he waited too. She tries to lift a finger remembers the precision required to thread a needle, notices her breath, her body still as though hanging from what she's not sure. A scene of children dressed in red and yellow flames running headlong into walls stuns the corners of her thoughts. But in the center, a room morphs into focus. It is cold. Windows open and blue light floods. The room becomes a theater. Her father appears upstage left. He is made of glass. Gently walks downstage. Sits in a glass chair at a glass table with glass legs. He is smiling, almost laughing. Backstage a metronome pulses 
Its echo fills the theater, saturates the blue light and her glass father, everything is porous. How beautiful, she thinks. The incandescent blue, the windows looking beyond the field, swaddling the swimming river. Her father reaches for her hand. The doe and fawn begin to open their eyes, lift their heads, shift their stiff, bruised bodies. Slowly, slowly, they stumble into the field, tall grass swallowing. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay, very much. You know, such images. I, I love the the verb pulling in the in the second uh, piece that you read, and that tragic imprint. What an imprint was left behind. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, I think now we're going to have some thoughts about um, how being up at the Mount uh, impacted people. And I know that Becky um, is going to help us share some thoughts from Kat and Catherine, I think. Um, and then after that, um, for our writers at the Mount, um, I don't want everyone to feel like you have to say something. Um, so if you would like to say a little bit about um, how that experience was for you. If you would um, put the hand icon up or just put your hand up. But um, anyhow, you're free not to talk about that if you don't want to, if you don't have anything to say about it. Becky? Miss Becky Jones? I am muted, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm gonna start uh, with Catherine's um, thoughts and when I and then I'm going to add just a little bit um because I had a sort of postscript when we were recording together I asked her to talk about her experience at the mount and then afterwards I asked her to I asked her what the sort of lasting impact was and so I'll just read what she wrote back to me so um let me know if you can hear this um without my sharing the screen Yet. You can hear it or can't? Cannot. Okay. Well, that's good that we cannot because it's the wrong um it's the wrong recording. So hold on a second. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so um, let me try one more time. Um, I had to find that one recording to stop it. So I'm going to try to share my screen without sharing anything but the sound. So um, let's see if that goes. And if it doesn't, uh, we can skip that part. Okay. My time at the Mount was amazing. I mean, I woke up every morning excited to write, which um, isn't usually the case. Um, I was excited to be at the Mount um, with the other residents and getting to know them and talking with them about their work. And even we shared our work at the very, the very end, and that was just amazing. I mean, these women were lovely and so talented, and their work was really inspiring, too. And um, the staff was wonderful. I mean, it felt like the Mount, we weren't guests at the Mount. It was it was like our home for a week. Um, they gave us keys. Um, it, it, we were free to wander and ask questions and they just took such good care of us. And, you know, for, writing is a solitary activity. So to be in a space where you're supported like that is uh, it's just incredible. It's a dream come true. I. You know, I wish I could stop time, go back and do it all over again. Um, could you see my whole screen there or just listen? Oh, we could. So you saw my messy screen. OK, um, and well, let me just tell you, <laughs> I'll try to do better the next time. Um, 
um, when I asked her um, about the lasting impact, she said um, that it was a great question. And the answer is resounding. Yes, it had a very lasting impact. After my residency, I came home with a renewed faith in my writing and feeling invigorated and determined to finish my novel. Also, because my time at the Mount left such a strong impression on me, I, I associate that week with creativity, productivity, and magic. I have found that I'm able to imagine myself back there whenever I get stuck and tap into that same vital energy. I've done this twice so far, and it really works. So um, shall I try to um, share um, Kat's recording with you? Yes. All right. Um, Unfortunately, I put her picture away, so I'm going to. Sorry. Right recording up. So on Kat's um, recording, she um, she gave her um, sort of introduction to what she was going to read at the beginning of her recording and, and then um, talked about her time at the Mount. So you're going to hear just a little bit of, of that. Um, but... This cat way, um, I'll be reading two poems for you today. And before I begin, I just want to thank Becky for organizing this reading and Pin and the whole Mount staff and the Straw Dog Writers Guild for this amazing residency opportunity um, at the Mount. It was really great to be able to work for a whole week uh, immersed in the world and the beautiful home of Edith Wharton. Um, and to learn more about her life and her writing and um, just to be really able to find dedicated time. It was a real gift. So thank you so much to everyone who contributed to um, us having this moment to really uh, focus on our writing. We'll stop there. Okay, thank you, Becky. Um, um, just, I'm going to try to um, share um, this. I'm, I'm going to try to spotlight everybody um, who who read, and we'll see how far we get. And if not, I'll I'll sort of remove everybody and put them back on. Um, so we'll see how far we can go. That's as far as I can go. So I'm going to take you all off spotlight. So we're just we're an equal opportunity community here now. Great. Thank you, Becky. And I see if we can get started that uh, Harvardy has had her electronic hand up there for a bit. Harvardy. Oh, so I really am. I'm so um, thankful to have this opportunity to actually see the other um, writers in residence. Um, I my week there was with Mario. Hi, Mario and uh, with Kat, and um, we um, had an unexpected huge snowstorm that week with 30 inches of snow, which um, made it quite exciting because we had to move in uh, a day into, um, into the residency. Uh, but it really gave, I think, Mario, me, and Kat a, um, an opportunity to bond because we were all so flummoxed, not quite sure what we should do. <laughs> And we ended up uh, having a drink each in the new end and reading to each other. And so um, that was something really special for me because I, I didn't know anything about their writing. Um, the um, uh, Jacqueline, Becky, Penn, and, and all of you, um, I really, um, I, I really, I don't even know how to explain to you what this residency has met. 
meant to me. You know, getting that first letter saying I had made it into the finalists, and I was saying, you know, there's that um, Jewish phrase, "Dayenu." I'm not Jewish, but I have a lot of Jewish friends, and I felt this is enough. You know, I made it into whatever the top, and this will keep me going. And then to finally get that letter saying you are one of the nine. Um, um, it's, you know, I think I'm one of probably one of the oldest residents you've ever had writers in residence. And um, uh, it, it was a very, um, I think for me, a moving um, testament to how one should try to do what has one has always wanted to do, regardless of age. And I think the, um, uh, the residency um, really emphasized that. And um, it has had a very lasting impact. I mean, I feel much more um, uh, less of a fraud, I guess, to be uh, to call myself a writer or at least a writer to be. And um, it has really spurred me on to be much more, um, you know, much more um, comfortable and, um, and sure of myself as a writer. And that only happened because of this wonderful opportunity that you gave us all. So thank you so much. <laughs> it's, it's, it was great. Thank you, Parvi. Wonderful to hear that. Emily, I see your hand. You're muted, Emily. Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> I think it was, I think it was Catherine who used the word magical in her recorded um, response to this. And, and that's really how I feel about the whole experience. It was really a magical experience. Um, I think a lot of what can be valuable about any kind of like residency or retreat is to be in a new different space away from like physically away from your normal life and this particular space and Edith Horton's house is so special and so magical feeling that it really feels like being in another world that's like this enchanted place with all these amazing people on the staff and everybody there and at the end who are so welcoming and so kind and um yeah, it was just inspiring uh, to be there um, and to be in the woods and um, to see her, Edith Wharton's library, all of these amazing things. And it really just felt energizing. And I think that has also been a lasting impact to kind of like Catherine said, to think about that time and how it felt to be there um, as a source of inspiration uh, when, you know, being at home in ordinary life makes it harder to find the time and to focus and to go deep into this kind of space where you have to be to write, um, to think about the memories of that week or it has been really a, a great source of, of inspiration for that. So and thank you to everyone who made that happen. It's incredible. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, it is wonderful to be able to immerse yourself in writing and not have to come out for a while. You get to stay there. Yeah. Lindsay. You're still muted. Sorry about that. Um, what everyone said also, and um, I was really struck by how, how immersive it was and how much it changed my experience of writing to know I was in the immediate company of writers like for six to eight hours and then for a week and that we were all <clears throat> kind of on this quest <laughs> together and it felt that power of community I, ne I never really got the kind of the the guts of it as much as I did um at the at the mount and also being in Edith Wharton space was amazing and learning more about her but I, I also want to say and this is part of why I love this discussion is what I think I loved most is having dinner with these women and the discussions that we had and the questions that we were able to ask each other about process and where do you get stuck? And how do you deal with getting stuck? And, you know, how does, <clears throat> what comes up for you? And what are the feelings? And we we really explored a lot that that isn't explored in a community where you just come together 
you know, once a week or something like that. Um, and I really valued that sense of, I, I almost want to say intimacy that, that was generated through our both emotional and intellectual discussion about what it is to be, to be writing and um, to be writing together. And, you know, it was, um, I, I have to say, I was utterly inspired by the women I was with and really grateful to them and really grateful to, to the mountain straw dogs. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Yeah. Uh, Emily Kiernan. Yeah, I mean, I really agree with what everyone has said, um, especially that point about uh, the people, you, the the co-residents were like such a huge part of it. I was with, there with Emily and Martha, uh, and it was such a fantastic experience. Um, but I also really wanted to to talk a little about the the effect of being in Edith Warren's home, um, and not only Edith Warren's home and where she wrote her books, but also where all these other incredible, you know, foundational writers had passed through, had written, you know, that Henry James had written there. Um, in, in some ways it was intimidating. There was a certain like love feeling of like, oh geez, I really have to step up. But there was also, I think, a feeling of of being welcomed and like being felt feeling in some way that we were being welcomed into that lineage, um, which was just so profoundly heartening and exciting and honoring. Um, even to, you know, I think my favorite part of the week was uh, the library tour, getting to actually see her books, touch her books, um, that experience of like, feeling up not only that I was you know in physical proximity with um with these wonderful writers but also in temporal proximity with this wonderful history of writers this was really really a profoundly exciting and um important part of the experience thank you Emily and and I know um your love of the library means a lot to the people at Edith Wharton because because they love it. They love every bit of that library. Thank you. Mario. Yeah, I think a lot of what Emily was saying too about just being in this home that has this great literary legacy and was, you know, it's a very energizing space, like everyone said, especially, you know, you get to be there in the off season, kind of behind the scenes. You know, you can take naps on the furniture. Um, special privileges. But um also just like being welcomed into this community that all of you have built and also the community over at the Mount as well, I think was also kind of like a wonderful thing that came out of this as well. It was just like finding more community, which I think is always important for writing and making art. Yeah, thanks, Mario. Sometimes when uh, at Straw Dog, when we send out surveys about what people uh, are looking for, what writers are looking for, it is almost always, we want more connection with each other. Writers writers like to be with writers. L writers need to talk with other writers. So important. Martha. Yeah, I mean, just everything everyone has already said in terms of like the energy that was there and like being in community with other writers. Um, and I recognize that like part of that magical feeling is a lot of logistical things that go into it and somebody's ordering food and somebody's organizing um stuff at the inn and you know just like all these very like you know thoughtful considerations for what our time there would be like um and that was really really amazing um and also yeah I mean just being I was in um, Edith Wharton's like boudoir room, which was just like so beautiful and like looking out and there was snow on the ground and like being able to walk the grounds like randomly in the middle of the day and having just like almost something close to like silence was really, really nice and um, such an incredible thing for my writing during that time. I th think I told folks at the Mount this, but I had written more in that those like five days than I had in months like prior to that. So that was awesome. Thank you, Martha. And I don't know if you could see the heads nodding from the other. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I wrote more in those five days than the previous months. 
any other comments from our writers? All right. Um, Becky, is this the time when if our audience um, has comments or questions that they can ask that? I think this would be the perfect time for that. All right, audience, if you could please um, use the hand little icon um, and I will try really hard to see everybody. We have a couple pages of people. If you have a comment you'd either like to make in general or if you'd like to direct it to a particular writer. And look at the other pages. All right. I can help you keep an eye out for those hands. All right. So far we have a shy bunch. Yeah. I'll just I'll just say um, it's not a question, just a comment of um, loving to hear how you all um, interwove with each other during your time together and how that impacted you and bolstered your writing. And, and also I'll echo what Jacqueline said earlier, which was that um, the being on the committee, I, I've, I read everyone's applications and to hear your embodied voice, whether, whether I was hearing the same thing or a different thing, it was just um, really lovely. And then also, you know, the very first um, time I met some of you was at the Mount on your first days. And so there's this uh, place of sort of nervous energy on everybody's part. And now to see you on the Zoom screen in your homes, you know, with the backgrounds um, chosen or the actual of reflecting your homes is just a very sweet, um, calmer, fuller, um, warm experience. And hearing you echo each other, um, interweaving your comments afterwards is really sweet also. I'm going to chime in here, if I may. Um, it's really wonderful to see you. Well, first of all, hearing you all is just, uh, I don't know, I feel like I've had the most delicious meal and dessert uh, that I could possibly imagine. But sharing you with the rest of our uh, more local community, writing community, because I know a lot of the names um, of the participant, of the attendees, uh, is a, it feels very special to me. Um, it, it's a very unifying and uh, s special treat. So I thank you all for being part of it. And it's it's really wonderful to see you all and hear your beautiful writing. I would like to jump in too and say as a reader and someone who lives in the Berkshires, and gets to do all kinds of writing events with a wonderful community groups at uh, the Wharton Estate, the Mount, and also who's gotten to hang out at Patricia's up on the mountain back in the day. I'm just thrilled and just was overwhelmed by the quality. And it was so hard to make any kind of decisions as a reader because there was such quality of work and then I was accidentally at the end this year as I was doing a dance workshop at Kripal and I was staying at the same inn and I got to meet some of the people and even somebody whose work I had read and recommended and I was thrilled. So this just brings it up another level to uh, hear people now and it's just getting me all excited for the new year. Thank you. Thank you. And, and in the history... It was just mentioned about the writing residency was that it start there are two different writing residencies that came together and one was at um, Patchwork Farm in West Hampton and that was that was completely funded through our generous anonymous donor through Straw Dog and um, people got to stay up at Patricia Lee Lewis's uh, retreat uh, for a little less than uh, you all did, maybe about five days, I think, or four. And then um, we joined forces with uh, the Mount and they had had a version of a, uh, a writing residency, but, but for very established writers and uh, 
one writer for a longer period of time. And they loved our idea of emerging writers, writers who were at the early stages of their writing career. So we've had several writing residencies, two streams really come together and it's working wonderfully. Any other comments from, from audience or anyone? Let me check the other screen. Well, in that case, I'm not sure where all of you are geographically at the time, but it is still a very beautiful day right here in Western Massachusetts. And um, I thank you all for coming. And I really, really am so glad that I had a chance, that all, we all had a chance to hear the writing residents read. Thank you so much. And I think that concludes our day here. Thank you all very much. Anything from you, Becky? Thank nope. you, Jessica. I'll uh, stop our recording and say thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.